Bismillah was salatu was salam ala rasulillah. My dear brothers and my sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is your brother Abdul Salam Abu Hanifa. And welcome to the second pep talk in the stigma, the series, the ladies or the women's stigma series talks. And this one here is going to be about how not to be, my sister, a meek prey to a second wife hunter. And uh, that is because in the first pep talk, subhanAllah, the way people have interacted, reacted to it was really mind-boggling. Eye-opener, certainly, sometimes shocked at some people's reaction. And one of the big problems that we face today is people take their personal experience and they rub it on other people's experience. While myself, I talk about the whole context of what I am witnessing in the community at large. In this pep talk here, we will see how you, my wonderful sisters, can, if you so wish, that is, to be or choose to be another wife or a second wife, as it's called today, to another married guy, and how to go about doing it in style so that you don't end up as a just mere victim. And also this talk is for you, my brother, who is out there looking to get married to a second wife, how you can also do it in style. For now, again, this is not a talk to discuss the evidences nor the implications of being involved in a multi-wives relationship, as this will be discussed, inshallah, in the future in another pep talk dedicated completely to that, because a lot of people don't get the real meaning of getting married to another wife. It's also not a talk about how to have a very successful multi-wives marriage, but what it is, well, you got to listen till the end, but just a briefly what it is, it is to save you, my sisters, rivers of tears, should you ever find yourself trapped or engaged in a second or multi-wives relationship. And that is because at one point or another, either your relationship breaks down or your marriage or whatever, and you find yourself with kids, and you think to yourself that life has come to an end, especially with the community stigma that a married or divorced woman is actually not a good woman. But in any case, let me now start on the main topic. Ideally, my dear brothers and my sisters, it would be totally wonderful that a married couple can stay together from the day they say I do or I accept or anything till that fateful day when they both die or one of them dies. It would be also fabulous to develop that kind of marriage where true love ruled over the couple till the journey to the graveyard presents itself. Once upon a time, Muslims thought that divorce only happened to non-Muslims and people who were not in Islam, and that Muslims were immune from divorce. How wrong we were, and how blind we still are, and how in denial the Muslim community at large is still in. It really is scary. As I said, wouldn't it be totally beautiful that every couple out there were just like the beautiful and life partners of two individuals or animals they stayed together from the day they got together until the day they died. For example, the Mexican gray wolf who keep the same mates forever, for life. They never change, they fight for each other, they stand each other until the male or female dies. But life, my dear brothers and my sisters, but life and circumstances are not always kind to us and either the divorce occurs because of our own doing or because of our partners. But when the dreadful gangrene shows its head and attacks the relationship, then the time to impute the members from the relationship becomes critical and bitterly real. Gangrene, for those of you who do not know, is a well, very well dangerous disease that hits the parts of the limbs of the body where there is not enough supply of the blood, say, to the hand, and then the hand will just get sick and it will change and it will get, if you don't ampute it, if you don't cut it, it's going to run to the rest of the body and you are going to die. In this case here of married couple, gangrene is the insufficient love, intimacy, uh, co-living, in, the, in between affection, in between affection and also communication. When these things start dying, gangrene has attacked your marriage and it's time to do something about it. Some couples, they refuse to accept reality. It doesn't matter how the couple is not functioning, yet they stay in the relationship together. However, when relationships do not 
work, then divorce is the next logical step to take. It is painful. It is a very painful process. And just like any other decisions in life, divorce could be the best thing to happen for the greater good of both the couple, the man and the woman, or also for the children. Women and men do not respond to divorce the same way. And uh, this is not perhaps the best time to speak about the emotional and psychological effects that a woman goes through. But as usual, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave the topic of divorce unattended in his book, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this beautiful religion of his. In fact, there is a whole surah called Surat At-Talaq, and that is number 65 in the Quran. Again, I am not going to deal with the whole divorce subject, but I would like to say that the amount of wellness and better future promises, along with an assuredness for a better life and better livelihood, is, that is going to be granted by Allah, in this surah of At-Talaq, the divorce, that is 65, is unbelievable. Allah knows, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that when divorce is near, the fear of the future becomes real. And in a lot of times, people feel fear, not because of what's happening to them. It's because at a subconscious level, they are thinking about the future. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees that a woman is going through a lot in her marriage. I keep saying woman, yes, it does happen to a man, but usually it's more women than men. That's why I speak more about uh, women. But if you are a man and you are in this situation, then know that there are exceptions and you are just one of these types. But in any way, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to encourage people to take the next step, i.e. divorce and break free, Allah placed a series of guarantees in the surah of At-Talaq, in the divorce, that he didn't place in any other surah in Al-Quran. Again, I'm not going to deal in details with this surah, that is when I speak about the divorce, but in this one here, just briefly, for you, my sisters, that are trapped in a very abusive relationship, in this surah here, there are about seven good news that it is time for you to take the matter in your hand and make for yourself a better future. Before I start on Surah At-Talaq, on the good promises, I want to say that Surah At-Talaq, i.e. Surah number 65, has got 12 ayat, 12 ayat, seven of which carry good news, seven of which carry good news. For example, the very first one is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يَتَّقِ الله يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا And this is ayah number two. And whoever fulfills taqwa of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make for him or for her a way out from whatever problem they are in. And he, i.e. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will provide for him from where that he or she does not expect. In ayah number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ And whoever relies on Allah, then Allah is his sufficient for him or for her. I.e., as you are going through the difficulties of life and you want to break away from this abusive, oppressive relationship, then rely on Allah. You do your part of the job, though, but you rely at emotional, intellectual, and belief level, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of you. Don't be fooled that your husband is arrogant, is muscled, he's dangerous, he's threatening, he will do this. Allah is far stronger than him. It's just some men always forget what Fir'aun forgot. And you would think they read Quran that they will remember. Hey, but that is how humans are. In ayah number four, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يَتَّقِ الله يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ يُسْرًا And whoever fulfills taqwa of Allah, he will make for him of his matters, or for his business, affairs, and everything, ease and easiness. Again, you just fulfill the taqwa deal from your end, and you leave the rest to Allah. When I say you leave the rest, it doesn't mean you go home and you cry. I mean you act, you work out, you find out solutions, you interact with people, seek advice, and all this kind of stuff, and leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will certainly make it easy for you. And that is a promise in the Quran, and it is in Surah At-Talaq. In ayah number five, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يُكَفِّرَ عَنْهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِ وَيُعْظِمْ لَهُ أَجْرًا And whoever fulfills taqwa to Allah, he will remove, i.e. Allah will remove and cover his misdeeds 
and his sins, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will usually reward him or her. There you go. This is another promise in Al Quran. Notice every time Allah speaks is that you fulfill your part of the taqwa. What that means is in interacting with your obsessive and oppressive and abusive husband, you want to always observe the laws of Allah. Because the more you stick to the path of Allah, and the farther he is from the path of Allah, even if he will sugarcoat it and that it is in the sake of Allah, but Allah knows best what it is for him and for not for him, keep your part of the deal and watch how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make things up for you. Another ayah also that is number 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ And whoever believes in Allah, وَيَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا And does the righteous deeds. يُدْخِلْهُ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ Allah will enter them in gardens and a jannah. And in this jannah there are gardens where you can see a river flows. خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا And they will stay abode in that place for eternity, never come out. Out of that, قَدْ أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ لَهُ رِزْقًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by putting them in that state there, has given them a good deed and good deal of sustenance in Jannah. So there you go. Endure. Act to get out, but endure to get out, and Allah will help you. I have always been fascinated by the last ayah in Surah At-Talaq, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the creation of seven heavens, and he also says that he creates seven earths, i.e. the earth that we have today, and there are six others that resemble earth with all the characteristics that are still out there. This is what people, or the cosmos, or all this NASA and everybody out there calls multiverse. Before we used to be a universe, but now we are no longer in a universe we are in a multiverse, i.e. there are at least seven other worlds that resemble our own world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in uh, the end of Surah At-Talaq, It is Allah who has created seven heavens. And of the earths, the like of the heavens, i.e. seven. The decreed matters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are sent down amongst these heavens and the earth so that you know every one of us that Allah is capable of doing anything that he so wishes. وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَحَاطَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ إِلْمًا And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has encompassed everything in these heavens and earths with his absolute knowledge. It always bugged me. Why did Allah end Surah At-Talaq with this multiverse? Then it dawned, alhamdulillah, that Allah is telling us, usually when you are married, you think that your world has crumbled, has come down. That say everything that you worked hard for is coming to an end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, don't lose hope. Just like I have created the seven heavens and seven earths, and there is a multiverse out there, when you come out from an abusive, oppressive, destructive divorce, you have other six worlds where you have a better opportunity to lead a better life. So never ever think that that's it. There is no way out. You have seven other worlds to get out to. But uh, being a human being, there is that scary thought that is lingering in the depths of your soul. Would I find a better husband to accept me and my children? Are there actually guys out there that are really up for marrying and leading a happy life? And the, also the general ladies' favorite gossip and the community where everything is doom and gloom. People are not serious about getting married. People are this and there are players and things like that. And then it creates a very dark, foggy environment right in front of your eyes and fear takes over. And if you are that optimistic, you will start thinking, will I actually ever fall in love with somebody? And here, it seems like we Muslims cannot fall in love. And the reason being is some people claim and preach that you cannot love anyone more than Allah. 
I even heard one day somebody, a sheikh, saying in a talk that if you love your wife or children more than Allah, you will sin. And as such, they made falling in love not permitted for us. And this has created a huge problem in the Muslim community. I remember once uh, somebody, I was working with a couple, and uh, the man told me, I love my wife, but I don't love her more than Allah. And I, right there and then I knew there was a problem in the understanding of this person here. My dear brothers and my sisters, the love of Allah is unique. The love of your wife is unique in another sense. You love your car and you love your children. You can't, nobody can come to you and says, if you love your car more than you love your children, that means you are a bad person, whatever it is they're going to tell you, because there are two different loves. Nobody has the right to come and tell you that. What the scholars said is, if the love of a person makes you commit sins, where Allah says don't do it, and your wife tells you drink wine, and you drink wine in obedience to her, that is a completely different ball game. But love as us humans, alhamdulillah, is absolutely beautiful and we are entitled to it and we're entitled to fall in love. We're entitled to look like two little kids into our each other's. We are entitled to everything that the world out there is entitled to. Alhamdulillah, we are praying, we do everything that Allah wants from us and that's why Allah created love and in the Quran has already spoken about how he made between us mawadda wa rahma and the mawadda is one other name of love and compassion between us. But I'll cover this another day. But anyway, the question for you is, would you ever fall in love? This is a question we need to spend 900 nights in prayers and fasting to find the answer. But the truthful answer is, yes, you can. And before finding that love, there is a stigma that we need to deal with. And that stigma is the divorce stigma in Muslim communities. And that is, this disease is present here in the United Kingdom or in the United States or in the lowest of the lowest of the backward countries in the cultures of Islam ever. If women, my dear sisters, if you do not stand up for your own rights, if you do not stand up to defend yourselves, if you do not fight to establish equality in your relationship, there will come time where you will have to pay a heavy price of shame and full liability for the failure of your marriage. Accusations and community gossip always go hand in hand. They actually never divorce. Fingers would be pointing out at you for not having been a great wife. Tongues shall be unleashed upon you for not having been by the side of your complete, faultless, and perfect husband. Frowny faces will be what you get for not having observed enough patience, for not having endured enough, longer enough, years enough, 20 years enough. Inkful pens will fountain down to record all the mistakes you made while blowing up the size and number of those mistakes. If one day you broke one egg, it will be you burnt a dinner. If one day you dropped a spoon, it will be you broke ten plates. If one day you forgot the light in the bathroom for one second, it is you left it on for a month. That will be written on your records. And just as if these problems weren't enough in themselves, the community will ensure that words of hurt will be DHL'd to you for having separated the children from their father. It's like all your fault. Then a few months down the line, they will, people, advertise on buses and national billboards to make sure you are reminded of your tragedy and never, ever out let it. You should have done something different. You could have done this. I.e. the community is here to torture, make your life miserable, torture you some more, make your life horrible, torture you some more, and make your life degradable. Very sad, really. Welcome to the Muslim grudges holders community. We're good at holding grudges and spreading lies and backbitings. We are very good at that. By getting together and do what Allah wants us to do, we're not. Everybody wants everybody to come to them. Nobody is willing to go to the other people. It's very strange. But in any way, 
And when all seems to be settling down, there will come a time when you wish to settle down one more time. For example, a year or two, every number of time goes by after you have divorced, after now you are by yourself, and now you'd like to take another opportunity to make things work for you. Find somebody who would actually take you over the mountains of the moon and down the valley of love. And yet you are hit by another favorite Muslim community game's second wife position application. The decision who to marry is not that easy and I truly understand that. And it's not easy to make because these days there are far more married eagles that are looking for that ultimate absolute, wonderful, lucrative relationship that they are looking for. And here you are, my dear sister, finding yourself in between staying single, single person, a single mother, a single parent, or get married to a Prince Charming. Sometimes the lack of availability of Prince Charmings will lead you to take the idea of settling for far less than what you deserve, and that is making do with being a second wife to some guy. And at some time, this will seem like a very good option, a very good idea. However, here are some few tips, my dear sister, to avoid you falling victim to sex predators. Believe it or not, in these days today, yes, the non-Muslims, they have the dating and fornicating and things like that. For us Muslims, subhanAllah, there are some people who don't care, Muslim or non-Muslims, they still keep doing that haram stuff, while others, they want to legitimize sex. So what they do is they look for a second wife for one and only one purpose, and that is, as you have guessed it, sex. Alhamdulillah, I am a guy and I have heard and I have read and throughout my life I have seen, witnessed and everything that there are some guys out there that are really and truly sex predators, accommodation seekers, or just a hit and run husband-ish age. He just acts for some time and then he's gone. So I will hear my dear sister, will provide you with few tips on how you can minimize the damage, okay? How you can, if you chose to, be a second wife, do it at least while being educated. But my piece of advice to you, avoid being a second wife. It never, ever works. Never, ever works. In my 30 so years of dawah, I have not seen a couple stay together for a long time. It always, and it ends up dirty and extremely dirty. So my advice, number one, please go ahead and get pen and paper and start taking notes. Okay, now that you are back with pen and paper, let's see. Number one is think high of yourself or you will end up married to an insect. It's either you think high of yourself or you will end up married to an insect. And as you know, my dear sisters, insects always feed on wounds and dirty, injured parts of the body. Uh, by you being armed with low self-esteem, you will just attract dirt bags, opportunists, and douchebags, and on top of that, good jerks. And that is because everything you will do, say, act, show, smile, everything will pinpoint to one thing, low self-esteem. That this lady doesn't think high of herself. I will come later on about talking about Islam and things like that. But for now, I'm telling you, get yourself into a high self-esteem level. Want to make sure that when the man comes and asks for your hand or talks to you or courts you, whatever, he want, you want him to see a full potential, capable, high-esteemed woman. Number two, if you are in need you will be exploited. I say it, if you are in need, you will be exploited. Because when you are needy, everything you do or say, how you behave will give it out. That's it. The per and at subconscious level, the guy will pick on that one there that you are in need. How you can be in need, there is a multi high variety of how you can be in need, and I will speak about some later on. But in this series of the stigmas, you will find out there are times, especially when you feel you are lonely. 
and you just want to be with somebody, it, you don't care who that is. As long as you have somebody you call my husband. At the beginning, that might seem like a good idea. But once you get with this person here and you start developing emotions, you will find that he is not on the same page as you and emotional conflicts start happening and then it's the doom, gloom, end of marriage type of end. Many times my phone rings and upon answering and the lady starts telling me what her problem is. And in a lot of times, of course, when I hear to the woman's complaint, I get an idea about the whole topic. Of course, I need to speak to the husband to get a full idea, but it gives me some kind of an idea about what's going on. Then once I establish with the lady what the problem is, the lady would start telling me that no matter what she did, he's never satisfied with it, he doesn't give her the respect that is owed to her, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, my point here, my dear sister, write this, please. And uh, this important law for you is this. Be your act. Don't act your acts. I repeat, be your acts. Do not act your acts act. What I mean by here is this. Laugh because you want to laugh. Not to show him that you can laugh. Or that you are a laugher. Or an obedient wife who laughs to his jokes. By that I also mean cook because you are a good cook. Do not cook because for him to see you are a good cook. Keep your house clean and tidy because that's who you are. That's what you like doing. Don't do it to him. Dress in nice dresses and look at yourself in the mirror and admire yourself because it's who you are. Do not dress up for him. Don't do anything for him. Don't do anything as an obedient wife. Don't be a Hollywood actress where you have to put so many different roles, all of these roles to impress him. Guess what? You will always be an actress. You'll never be who you are. And if the man doesn't see who you are, then he will always see somebody who is putting on an act and nobody has respect for anyone that is putting an act. This is why, my sister, be your act. Become what you do. Do not act it out. It never pays out and it is always so phony and so plasticky. Please. And again, the way you present yourself to the guy, the way you introduce yourself to him, the picture he gets formulated about you in his mind is absolutely crucial because that is how he is going to treat you in the future. So make sure whoever introduces you to the other guy must ensure that they sell you high. So when you do something to that whatever it is person, do it because it is you. Again, my sister, don't be a Hollywood star. It never happens because Hollywood star, what they do is they read a script, they rehearse a script, they do many takes, and the best take gets put on the movie. That's exactly what you do. You're reading a script, you're acting out a script, and you try your best to deliver the best of that script. Guess what? The husband can see through that, and he will use that against you, and he will abuse that against you. Watch out. So again, be your act. Do not act your act. Have you noticed how every year Hollywood holds an Oscar nominations and winners and all these things for the best actors and all that kind of stuff? It's because if it was easy to be an actor or an actress, there wouldn't be a need for nominations and Oscars, right? Well, there you go. You can't be an actress all the time. You have got to develop yourself to be who you are. Or else you will always be performing to get Oscars from him. And if your husband is a bad judge, the next Oscar will be in the grave. Next point, my sister, do not jump in in the name of Islam. Strange, huh? Don't do it. Marrying quickly will work against you no matter how you dress it up. Infatuation feelings, loneliness feelings, and sexual arousal feelings can wreak havoc in your thinking process. Believe me, it will make you see things cloudy and you will make the worst of judgments on that time there. Again, I hear you say you wanted to act on Islam. You, Islam is your priority. You know what? 
Men use Islam to get you as a second wife. So always remember how many men who came with Islam left with Islam. A lot of men come with Islam and live like monsters. So please, please, please. Islam, alhamdulillah, he's Muslim, you are Muslim, that's enough. Now we're going to take next thing, his morals. And this is why the hadith of Rasulullah says, إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَ if any comes to you that you are pleased with his deen, i.e. the understanding of al-Islam, wa khuluqa, khuluqa is the morals, the characteristics, because the understanding of his Islam will generate for him his behavior. So if he is acting different than what he believes, keep away. Honestly, do keep it away. But anyway, please, 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 keep this rule in mind. The quicker you jump in, the quicker he jumps out. In his mind, it reads desperation, not facilitation. Again, the quicker you jump in, the quicker he jumps out. Because in his mind, it reads desperation, not facilitation. Again, when a lady calls me with her problems, I ask, her, who was your wali? I, I don't know who he was. I, I don't remember. Or, who was your wali? I called him, but he changed his number. Do you know his full name, his address? No, I don't know. Or, who is your wali? It was his friend. Or, or, or. Subhanallah. And then I say, who are the witnesses that were present at the time of the uh, marriage? I really, it's uh, Muhammad Abdullah. Uh, does, does it have the number? No, it's just his signature. Does it have an address? No, it's just the name and the signature. Well, my dear sisters, please pay attention to this. If his wali is his friend, it spells problems at the end of the road. If the witnesses were bought from the next superstore or Tesco's, i.e. they were just picked up in the street or in the masjid, excuse me, do you have 10 minutes? Can you just come and witness for a marriage? What's your name? Muhammad Abdullah. Okay, Muhammad Abdullah. And that's that. Then one day you will end up in problems. And today, more than 60 to 70% of the problems is the ladies don't know who their wali is, nor do they know who their witnesses are. So how are we going to sort out that thing? We got married. Married in some Islamic center, I don't remember anymore what Imam married us. Okay, can your husband talk? No, he doesn't want to talk. He is the man. He holds the divorce in his hand. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't. All this, my dear sisters, is because you jumped in into a relationship with the name of Islam. Of course, you had your reasons, and one of them, if desperation is, here you are today in your desperation. And then you set on a journey to get to launch a war against anything else that you feel is angry in you. My question is, and this is from practical experience. Well, Lai Radim is from my practical experience. 99% of the problems women faced, if they did a little research before they handed their body over to this predator, they wouldn't be in this situation. Another principle that is number five is always my sister. Figure out what he really, really wants. Because a guy looking for a second wife is 99% looking for a new sex partner. He can sugarcoat it, he can Islamic code it, he can discode it and passion and compassion and blah, blah, passion. The bottom line of it all is sexual neediness. It is more his wishes to have an extra fun from the marital bedroom he finds himself already in. No man out there, no man out there, I haven't seen who is really in love with his wife would even spend two seconds looking at another woman, much less looking for a second wife. No man who loves his wife would want to marry a second wife. Not impossible. Because if you ever have been in a true love feeling, you know, my brothers and my sisters, that that love makes every woman out there and every man out there obsolete, non-existent. This is why Rasulullah when he married our mother Khadija, the 28 young lady, Okay, maybe I'm surprised you think she's 40. No, she was a 28. Go online on my YouTube channel, Islam Pep Talk, and there is a whole talk about the age of our mother Khadija and that she was 28 uh, of age, not 40. But in any way, in his first marriage, he truly was in love with that beautiful woman. He never, ever 
looked at any other woman. When he went to Al Madina, he was made to marry the nine women from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Rasulullah obeyed. So please, please, please always pay attention. Any man that shows in front of your face wanting to take you as a second wife, know for a hundred percent sure that he is not happy in the bedroom of his wife. And then you are. So what he will do, he will keep his emotions, everything around his first wife, and you will become the sex giver that his wife can't give. And as such, you become just like the fifth wheel. He uses you when he needs you, and the main point of concern for him and priority is his wife with whom he has his children. Pay this and put it, write it on a refrigerator, because you really need to figure out what he really, really wants. Of course, he is not going to tell you that he is looking for somebody new to both divert him from his current marriage and give him the opportunity to have some fresh meat. But he will do his very best to dress it up or dress up his agenda with talks about the Quran and the Sunnah, the companions, and how the great women were husband sharers, and how a lot of great companions were second wife to this and that. Absolutely nonsense. You must not marry someone who says he wants to marry you because it is a sunnah. Honestly, don't marry someone who wants to marry you because he says it is a sunnah, it is halal to do it because it's in the Quran. Because you as a human being, you want someone to marry you because of loving you, not because it's a sunnah. I'll give you an example. You go to a place where they sell some kitchen stuff, okay? And you see this absolutely beautiful frying pan. And, uh, but you've got already one that is at home and a beautiful frying pan. And you think to yourself, do I buy it because I can? Do I buy it because I love it? Oh, yeah, Allah, this is beautiful. I love this type of fans. Most people will buy it as a second frying pan, just in case something happens to the first one. And that's what it's going to be, a second frying pan. So don't you ever marry somebody who tells you it's a sunnah, it's good, Allah will reward you. Marry someone who marries you because of you. Another extremely precious point, my sister, in your safety is watch out what he promises. Because what he promises and what he speaks about, what he prioritizes, will tell you a lot about him. There is a huge difference between him prioritizing an Islamic lifestyle and marriage or that he'd be interested in a committed and loving relationship. If he marries you because of Islam, what he means, he means the man-designed Islam, not the divine one, okay? It's the man-authoritative man, as you know. That is the kind of Islam. So always pay attention to what he says what he prioritizes, what he puts forward, the hadith, the, every, the argument, pay attention. People tell you a lot about themselves without them realizing that. Ask him a lot of questions. What he wants, why does he want a second wife? And plainly, my sister, openly and sincerely ask him not to use Islam as an excuse. You know, when I do my coaching with people, I tell them, please don't use, inshallah, alhamdulillah, bismillah, don't use this, because I want you now, we are working, and I want you to give me the facts. The same thing. When he wants to marry a second wife, ask him, why? Don't tell me it's a sunnah, don't tell me it's Quran. I know these things, okay? Why you want to marry me, a human to a human? Don't tell me what gives you the permission to marry me, but I want the why you want to marry me. And please do not let them use Islam as an excuse. Ask him questions about his current situation. Don't stay in the dark about his current life. A lot of girls, they call me, oh my brother, his wife, before I didn't know, she said this, I didn't know, he didn't tell me, I couldn't, and I didn't, and I wouldn't. And I said to them, why didn't you ask? Because it was not the right thing to do. Subhanallah, you trust in your life to share it with someone, and you tell me it's not, it was not important to do that? No. Ask him a question. Excuse me, brother, why would you want to take a second wife? What it is about the wife that you don't like now? How is you marrying me going to change your life, make it better? How is me marrying you is going to make my life better? How are my children going to find you? What are you going to bring to this family? I'm not talking about the bedroom here. I'm talking about us as a whole. Your financial contribution. Put it all on the talking. Ask him what he's going to do. 
with your children? How much benefit is he going to bring to your children? Please don't be afraid of asking. Don't be shy. You're bringing a man into your kids' lives. If we are not Muslims, you could say this is your uncle, but this is not your uncle. This is my husband, and potentially the father of your next brother or sister. So you want to make sure that the person you're bringing in is fit to be in. Another point, my sisters, use what Allah gave you. Your female intuition. A lot of girls, they threw, a lot of sisters, they threw this intuition behind their back for a hadith. Don't do it. Al Islam will never ask you to do something that is not intuitive to a woman. Believe me, Allah has equipped you with that intuition to sift through players, the nonsense talkers, and things like that. Use that. And that gives you an infinite power in your hands. Because by including just a few tried and true methods in your bags of social skills, you can set him, you can get him at ease, and get him to relax enough to reveal his truth. Because my sister, you must understand that behind each and every beard is a hidden agenda. Your job is to get him to spit his guts out so you can make a responsible choice. Don't buy on promises only. Buy on facts. I.e., don't marry on fake promises. Marry on good, real, tangible facts. If he is hard to open up, lead him. So he puts his cards on the table. His truth, my sister, you must know before you say yes. And you not doing what you're supposed to do and hoping that Allah will reward you just because you acted on that Islam. That's why you're getting so many divorces these days and so many transgressions and oppressions. Allah wants you to do your homework and do it very, very well. And what I mean by his truth is his sense of authenticity, his real personality, who he really is. Not who he wants you to see now. And what he really, really, really wants. Because many brothers, and I am one, and I hear them when they talk, they just want a second wife for what? For the bed, that's it. And they wish they just come for the bed and will leave the next day, go to work and not show off until the next hormonal uh, contribution comes in, sex comes in, go to the wife, and that's that. And my sisters, please, for the love of of Allah. For you to be able to really, really blow his disguise covers, you got to know how to get authentic yourself. Many of you, my sisters, are not authentic. Many of you have been victimized by the stereotype of what a woman should be. And I will tell you what the, the community wants you to be, and it's not good for you at all. So you really want to understand and find out who you truly are, your authentic self. And finding who you truly are is not that easy. It really is not. Because many of you, my sisters, have been brought up, if your parents are Muslims, that's how you have been brought up. If not, if you embraced Islam as a convert, then people would turn you, they will brainwash you to act and behave in a certain submissive, obedient, depersonalized, ready to be ridden sexually, woman. And the more depersonalized you are, the closer to Allah you are. This is the general idea. But is that true? Is really Allah wants you a person with no personality? Just like, uh, come here, go there, sit here, stand there. That's all there is to it. And when you dance to his tunes, that's how close you are to Allah. Wallahi, by Allah, that is not what an Islam came for. In me working with couples and working with ladies who have been abused and listening to all these problems, I have come to realize that a Muslim woman is truly not herself. I ask sometimes questions to women and they say, I lost myself. I don't know no more what I am. I'm just trying to be what I am told to be. A lot, if not the majority, are led to believe that the best Muslim woman today or wife tomorrow is she who is accommodating, conformable, you conform to anything, you complying, docile, domesticated, dutiful, ready to give in any time, lowly, malleable, meek, non-resistant, and also non-resisting. You have got to be passive, resigned to your designated corner. You have to be tame, unresisting, and the best of them all, 
totally obedient with the icing on the cake is for her to be uncomplaining. That's what it is. That's what they want you to be. And that's who you are in a way or another. All those 18 characteristics that the community and the designed men designed Islam want a woman to be are not appealing to the majority of men. It's ironic that the society wants a woman to be in this particular way and the man then loses respect for her and here comes the big problem. I personally, my sisters, do not want an obedient woman or any woman that has any of the 18 characteristics. I'd rather stay single than marry this type person. What do I want? I want a feminine woman. And this is what Al-Islam wants you to be. Al-Islam wants you to be feminine, not a depersonalized woman, a woman who doesn't know anymore. If you are a woman or a girl or you don't know no more. Because, again, I will reiterate what the society wants of you. Take a pen and take how many of these are yourself. Accommodating. Are you accommodating? Conformable. You conform to anything your husband says or anything to the society says. Complying. Docile. Domesticated. You've got to be dutiful to your husband and ready to give in any time to him and his desires and wishes. You have to be lowly as in highly. Opposite highly is lowly. You have to be malleable like the poultry or in the hands of a kid. The guy has and can uh, shape you any how he likes. You have to be meek, non-resistant, and also in the future non-resistant. You have to be passive. And you got to be resigned to your designated corners by him. And you have to be tame, unresisting. And the best of them all, my sister, you got to be totally obedient. And the icing on the cake is, as I said, you got to be uncomplaining. All these characteristics call for abuse and unjust dominance. And you hand them on a golden platter to this husband. Stop it. Don't do it. So how do you do when you meet a man? Show him your femininity, not what I mentioned, the 18 horrible characteristics. Don't show him that you're obedient and all those things. It doesn't work. Be feminine. That's absolutely appealing. Let him know that you will not mask any of your personality, that you are not going to flush down the toilet all the great characteristics that you worked so many years to acquire, and that you are going to dress your beautiful personality in completely dark piece of cloth to never see the true colors again. Let him know that you are your own. He is your partner, not your master. And uh, also, my dear sisters, as I am uh, at it now, Al-Islam doesn't ask you to lose your personality. It asks you to marry his personality. If you are yellow and he is green, when you marry the two colors, they give a new color. You got to understand marriage is you marry two identities, two souls, two things. Just like when you marry two bodies, they give one baby. You got to marry two loves to give you one baby love. But anyway, I don't want this talk to go on forever. It's about close to an hour now. So let me tell you how to spot his true persona. I'm going to give you three types of personas that most people will hide under. And these are really problems for you, my sister, and you can work on them. Take your pen and write again. Persona number one is the player. This is the brother who prides himself in his ability to work himself into the lives of just about any woman he chooses. He thinks that because he knows how to manipulate a sister's situation to his advantage and use her weakness into making her like him through using certain behaviors and patterns of speech and even perhaps bringing the world of children to her and roses and all this kind of stuff to blur her emotions and judgment. And then once the lady gets attached to him, he pulls away and creates a vacuum of neediness in her. And then when she is needy and desperate to because she likes him and she thinks she's not going to get anyone better than him, he comes in and sets his rules. 
i.e., when the time for mahar comes in, he's not going to pay you 500 pounds, he's going to give you 50 pounds. Because now you are totally desperate and you are more in need of him than him, of you. Because he is a player and you are not a player at all. There are many brothers who have developed a second wife collection game plan, my sisters. There are even websites, second wives websites. I haven't been to any of them, but I have been told about them. Because I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a partner, so people <laughs> tell me to go then and look for that. But in, anyway, many marry for a short period of time sleep endless times with that lady there. Some of them are really careless to make a baby or not. And then, before they, you know it, they are gone. And when they leave, they don't care about the havoc and the problems they left behind them. And they think once they leave, only two rak'at and that's it, Allah will forgive their sins. It's not going to happen like that. This kind of forgiveness doesn't happen in this world. The player, my sister, the brother player will be nice attractive, warm enough for him to make you like him. Then he will reduce his interaction with you to create, as I said earlier on, a void in you. Then before you know it, you are chasing him and desperate to marry him with a mahar of 50 pounds or less. How to protect yourself, my sister? Be smart and protect yourself. Don't play along to his tunes and you must use your female intuition and get through his tunes and silly games. Keep in mind, my sister, that you are not interested in marrying a player. If he is player at the first moment, he's going to be player later on and he's going to be a player when he leaves. Do not marry him because he is interested in you as a second wife. Raise to the challenge, my sister, and make him realize that he shouldn't be interested in marrying you as a second wife, but to marry you as a wife, a human being. Drop the second. If he can't drop that from his mind at the time of courting or asking for a hand or whatever, you will always be the second pair of shoes. I swear to you, it's not going to get any better for you. Number two is the inappropriate companion. Inappropriate companion. This is the guy who, in, when you see him, you think like you're looking at Omar ibn al-Khattab or Sa'd ibn Mu'adh. You're looking at the companion. This is the guy whose primary mission is to make you like him by portraying himself as a time traveler whose travel machine set off 1,400 years ago and only reached you today. It is the guy who is always seen in the masjid, but nobody knows where he lives. The guy that people know he works, but nobody knows where he works. The person is wearing always qamis and the beard and mashallah and subhanallah and alhamdulillah. Every two words are uh, uh, followed by one of these things. And that person there, when you look at him, his point is, I am a pious person. However, this particular companion is making one huge mistake companionship must be coupled with how much respect he can show you my sister use your female instinct listen to reason not empty emotions and fake promises that he will respect you later on in the marriage and certainly do not believe him when he says one day I was walking out with Rasulullah and then we saw this thing nobody is a companion <laughs> you get my idea Okay, because my sister, please, 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 wallahi, the number of tears and the hours I spent on the phone and I spent on the phone listening to ladies when I asked them, why did you marry this person? Oh, he was pious and he goes to the masjid and a couple brothers had vouched for him and he's got a long beard. That's all you married him for? Yeah, because Islam says and things like that. But in any way, a general, my sister, and a very expensive and fatal error is that women easily fall for is a bearded guy who uses Islam to his advantage and uses fancy names, terminologies, and as I said, he is the inappropriate companion. He should have been with the Rasulullah, but he happened just to be with us today. How to tackle this issue here? Don't be scared of asking a knowledgeable person to give you second opinion. A knowledgeable person that tr you trust, someone that knows you and holds your benefit at heart to sit with this person here and actually go into the nitty-gritty of his companionship to see really if he is a companion that was with Abu Bakr or he was just a fake Mexican under a sombrero and he calls himself a companion. Other terms, don't jump in a relationship just because it's in Islam.
Then comes the third person that seems to be shy or maybe disinterested. Sometimes you meet somebody and you talk to them and you feel there is like some spark there going on. Please, by the love of Allah, go with that spark. If the spark is not at the beginning, don't go for it. It's not going to work out later on. And again, if you feel there is a spark, but you can't seem to break past a barrier that this person maybe is not talkative, maybe he's shy, maybe he can't talk properly, blah, 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 whatever it is, then you need to suss the guy out, whether it's true that he is a shy person or just a disinterested player because really players they can take so many personalities and Allah helps you in going through the wit and need of these things and again have a few general questions about different topics don't ask him uh, interrogation, uh, interview questions. What do you do? What do you do? No, ask him, for example, see if he's interested. Uh, how much does he know about cosmology? How much does he know about uh, sea life? How much does he know about uh, uh, Australia? How much does he know about electronics? How much does he know? How much does he know? The broader he is, the better it is for you because you will have an intelligent person that you can hold conversations with. And when I mean conversation, I mean mouth conversation, speaking, not the bedroom conversation because again 99% marry for the bedroom conversation my sisters I oh it's 58 here so I want to just make sure that I tell you this being a second wife is exactly as it is in the mind of guys you are a backup woman for his needs that he is not getting from the main wife being a second wife is exactly what it is you are a second wife in his mind, in his priorities, in his choices, in his heart, you and your children, who are another guy's children, will never ever occupy his world at the first place. And you never ever see his bank account, nor see his first choice, that is the woman that he's married to, or actually be his first choice for a holiday or break. He is again looking at you as a second person. One final thought, my sisters, today is, as they say out there, you get what you pay for. Being a second wife these days here in the United Kingdom or in Europe means to the man, to people out there, that you as a woman couldn't get the simplest of men. And because of that, you settled to let your rights and who you are go to be a second wife to somebody, second place in their lives. And if, my sister, this is not enough for you to take every precaution before you say, I do or I accept, and you take a man, strange man, to your kids, firstly, if your husband, my sister, is not going to give you 100% of your right, trade it out. Don't take him home for the love of Allah. We all have sexual desires, but we can control them. We all have lonely times, but we can control them. I'd rather be alone than be uh, crying rivers later on. And I can tell you, my dear sisters, if I could squeeze my phone to drain it from the tears that women have cried when talking to me on the phone, I will have a huge swimming pool. An Olympic one. Finally, my sister, if you are married and you have one man, and if your husband is talking or joking about taking a second wife, then wake up. No man who is truly in love with his wife will joke into taking a second wife. If your husband starts taking a second wife, it means you are not aware of certain changes that take place or that are taking place in the couple. Wake up and start working on that. Because if you become or you stay oblivious to his needs or to the relationship as a whole, then you will become one day one of the two wives. And believe me, every man that marries a second wife will end up in problems both in both of his marriages. Again, this is your brother Abdul Salam Abu Hanif, and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our hearts to using the truth. This is not a talk about marriage, multi-marriage, and the evidences and everything, but more of a practical the tips for a woman, a Muslim woman, to stop being a meek prey and a weak prey for second wife hunters and sexual predators, so that my sister, when you marry, you get another opportunity to lead a happier life, both in the bedroom 
and out of the bedroom. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us all, to help us all, to guide us all. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you disagree with something, if you think what I'm saying is absolutely nonsense, whatever it is, please do get back to me and I'll be more than happy to explain, discuss, talk and all that kind of stuff. This is again your brother Abdul Salam Abu Hanifa and if you want to be part of my uh, WhatsApp group, please do send me a message on 0044 Seven eight seven six four zero eight seven three five. Allah bless you all and give you the best husband and for us guys gives us the best wives. Wa salli Allahumma ala nabiyyina Muhammad subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik ashadu la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu alayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.